All right, guys, here we are. We are on chapter two, key issue four, and we're gonna learn about some overpopulation issues and um, what, how to lower populations. Um, we're gonna talk about Malthus's theory, the epidemiological transition model, and population policy. So let's get started. So here we are, things we're gonna need to know, what we're gonna learn about here. What are the fundamentals of Thomas Malthus's theory? What are the details that support Malthus's theory? What are the details Malthus's critics use to invalidate or discredit his theory? And what are some of the world health threats? Let's talk about this uh, Thomas Malthus. He said there was going to be a population bomb. He lived in England from 1766 to 1834. And keeping in mind, he lived in England when England had obviously the Industrial Revolution began in England, the introduction of machines to manufacturing, agriculture, and other areas of life that co created uh, better sanitation and hygiene, so led to this population bomb. That decline in the crude death rates, that explosion into the natural increase rate, and pushed England into stage two. So England's the first country to go to stage two. So they really have no experience with this. And so when he looked around, he saw this population exploding. And he felt that population was growing exponentially and resources, especially food, were growing linearly. And what that means is, is exponentially means if you have two people, they will double to four, four to eight, eight to 16, 16 to 32, 32 to 64, and so on in this pattern. While the resources, especially food, were growing linearly, which means you have one unit and that becomes, add another one, it's two units, add another one, it's only three units, add another one, it's only four units, add another one, it's only five units. And so he believed that a population bomb, a crisis was coming, and that people needed to practice moral restraint to lower crude birth rate, or there was going to need to be a disaster that would increase the crude death rate in order to solve our population problem. He wrote this theory in an essay on the principle of population in 1798. And again, a couple of things. One, overpopulation means you have too many people given the amount of resources available. So it's about this comparison of people versus resources. And it becomes overpopulated when you have too many people given the resources. And again, he believes that population grows geometrically. That's where it grows in this 2 to 4, 4 to 8, 8 to 16, 16 to 32, 32 to 64, and so on. While food supply grows arithmetically or linearly. One unit add more is two units, add one more is three units, add one more is four units, and so on. And so criticisms of Malthus, they say that this is too pessimistic of a viewpoint on human outlook and human society. But this failed to consider technological innovations. And the Marxist critique of human population growth is actually a positive. So let's take a look here. This is the graph that actually represents Malthus's theory. And you can see here's Malthus's theory. Here's population growing exponentially. And you can see that that rapidly becomes this compounded growth. Here's his food and resources growing linearly. And he calls this point right here his point of crisis. And this is where population outpaces food and resource production. And that now we're going to have an upheaval and a war over resources and food because people need resources, they need food call that a point of crisis. And so we have our Neo-Malthusians, and these are the people who still believe that this theory is relevant and could happen today, this population bomb. Two recent issues invigorated this theory. One, many countries in the world today are experiencing population growth only and mainly because of the transfer of medical technology. And what that means is, is that um, that they're not, they're, they're growing because their death rates are due to lowering because they're getting new technology given to them. 
and that this new population that is now growing so quickly is stripping the world of the resources that we are now using up so many resources, both uh, natural, mineral resources, our physical resources, and our food resources. And soon, we're going to have a crisis. Ehrlich in 1960s, another geographer, a pro Malthusian, warned of a population bomb in the 1970s and 1980s because the world's population was outpacing food production. Critics of Malthus, those people who say, no, this is not going to come true, say it's not true because resources are not fixed, that we can increase our food production. We can move to renewable energy resources and, and um, create new ways of having more ecumene and less non-ecumene. And this would be possibilism and the use of technology. That the lack of food has to do more with the distribution of wealth and food rather than insufficient food um, and, and resource uh, numbers. That if we had a more equal distribution of resources and wealth and food throughout the world, that it's not a food supply, resource supply issue, it's an allocation issue. And that population growth, this is the Marxist view, the Karl Marx view. That population growth can actually stimulate economic growth, that the more people you have, the more consumers you have, the more creativity you have. So here's Malthus's theory and what happened in reality. So here's his population growth. He had no way of knowing that England, as well as many other countries, would, would push through stage two and into stage three, meaning that they would find a way to lower their crude birth rates through empowerment of women, through education, through access to contraceptives, and, and also just economic growth and change, and that this would also happen to other countries in the world. So we didn't have as high as a population growth as he thought, and at the same time, you can see both wheat and rice have increased production substantially. We saw this increase in production due to the uh, Green Revolution, which is the introduction of genetically modified seeds and um, use of chemical pesticides and herbicides, as well as chemical fertilizers. So let's talk about how um, a country can lower their crude birth rates. So there are various ways we can do this. The number one way to, rate, to lower your uh, birth rates is obviously logistically with the use of birth control through the distribution of contraceptives actually giving people the ways, the, 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 um, the means to physically limit the number of children that they're going to have. The other is gender empowerment, women empowerment, women having equal rights, women allowed to have jobs, women allowed to be educated. This creates more reliance on economic development where it's more about economics, where they are concerned more about wealth and children cost more. And in order to gain wealth, you need better education and better jobs, which leads to people wanting to have less children, especially women. Here we have access to family planning and the types of family planning throughout the world. You can see here in Western, Central, Sub-Saharan Africa, this is where we see the least and lowest access here. All right, next let's talk about the epidemiological transition theory and the epidemiological transition model, which also has had a significant impact on population growth. These are the stages um, that we, the world has gone through in terms of disease and how disease has impacted human population over the period of civilization. So this theory describes the changing pattern of population, age, di distributions, mortality, fertility, life expectancy, and causes of death. This is the process by which the pattern of mortality and disease in a population is transformed, transferred from one of high death rates among infants and children, and episodes of famine and epidemic affecting all age groups, to one of more degenerative and, and human-made diseases, like lifestyle choices, such as those attributed to smoking and obesity that affect principally the elderly. Let's talk about this epidemiological transition model. There are five stages to it. 
And earlier in our human civilization, we, we had stage one. And this does correlate to the stages in the demographic transition model. So we had stage one. This was earliest in our civilization. And the deaths were primarily from infectious and parasitic diseases and from famine, like Black Plague. Then, as they progressed into stage two, you started to see that there was more receding pandemics, but more disease that was because of people being in close quarters as the more people moved into cities. Example here would be like cholera. Stage three, you start to see this shift into as we become more wealthy as a society and we make more lifestyle choices and we're less mobile in terms of our activity. You see the more degenerative and human created disease from like cardiovascular disease, heart disease. This is from obesity, from food choices and cancers. Stage four was more delayed degenerative diseases. So those lifestyle choices made earlier in life would lead to this delayed disease that you would get later in life, um, much, much after those lifestyle choices like Alzheimer's and diabetes. And then we have stage five where we are also emerging into stage five now with the re-emerging infectious and parasitic diseases like um, pandemic flu, like COVID-19, malaria, TB, SARS, and AIDS. So again, that epidemiological transition model explains the stages of death for um, humans over the uh, time of human civilization. Let's talk about population policies and what countries can do, um, countries that can do to encourage population growth and what they can do to discourage population growth. Encourage, we consider these expansive pronatalist policies. You see this, saw this in communist societies like the Soviet Union and China, Mao Zedong. Also see this in a lot of European countries as well as Russia, um, where they're encouraging people to have kids. They give tax incentives, they give paid time off, they give cash incentives. They give job leave for both men and women. In some countries in Europe, both men and women get a full year to two years um, of paid time off to, after they have a kid. There's free daycare, free, um, free access to services. This, they did this in Sweden as well. So those are expansive or what we call pronatalist. Natal means baby. Restrictive or antinatalist population policies, they use these, countries can use these to reduce the rate of their natural increase rate through a range of means. For example, they um, did this in China with the one child policy. Um, they gave people income bonuses, better health care benefits, better retirement pensions, priority in housing if they only had one child. They also fined people if they had more than one child. So, this, this, if you go from, from under the replacement, which is 2.1 children per couple, and you go just to one, this will lead to this drastic shrinking of your population growth rate. All right, let's talk about some solutions to population growth rate. The number one solution to population growth rate is empowerment of women, gender empowerment, more money for contraception and education, equal rights, equal access to jobs, um, more changing cultural norms to value girls. Changing the shift from stage two to stage three, which is the lowering of the birth rate in three, is the hardest of the stages to progress into and through because it requires serious cultural change in, in status in women and also the view of birth control educating men with responsibility for birth control, sterilization, access to contraceptives. And so we have to address these uh, traditional religious values that encourage gender preference in large family, redistribute wealth, improve standards of living for the poor so children aren't as necessary, improve farming techniques in poor areas so that they have more food and limit starvation and malnutrition. All right, guys, this concludes our um, presentation about key issue four. Thank you so much.